So hello again uh, from my side. Welcome to this fifth webinar in a series of a EU-US exchange on energy efficiency in buildings and housing. Today's webinar is going to focus on the topic, topic of building standards and codes to drive the renovation of buildings. My name is Oliver Rapp and I will be moderating this webinar today. Um, before we start, I would like to ask all the participants to mute their microphones. I hear a little bit of background noise. I don't know where it's coming from. And um, while we give access to all the participants, we want to launch a very quick poll. Um, and in this poll, we would simply like to ask you where you are coming from. What sector do you represent? Do you come from an NGO? Do you work for the government or rather for the private sector? Um, for industry um, or for any other type of organization, please write that in the chat box so that we simply get some statistics of where you're coming from and who you are representing. That would be wonderful. Um, in the webinar today, we will have speakers from the US Department of Energy, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Institute for Market Transformation, DG Energy from the European Commission in Brussels, the EPB Center, and the Regulatory Assistance Project. Um, this series is organized um, in collaboration of my own organization, BPAE, and the Institute for Market Transformation in the US. And we're doing it in cl very close collaboration with the European Commission, with the Department of Energy and the Department for Housing and Urban Development. And all this is done under the heading of the US-EU Energy Council, and of course with the intention to simply exchange on good policy practices, on good industry practices, and to simply trigger an increased exchange of information, an exchange of learning, and uh, a better collaboration across the Atlantic between the US and the EU. And uh, we are now seeing the results of the poll. So now you get a picture of uh, where the audience is coming from. We have about 18% from the NGO civil society sector, 23%, that's uh, almost a quarter from the government, um, then 30% from the private sector, 14% from industry and 14% from another sector. Now, that is wonderful. And uh, with that, I would already like to move to a short housekeeping session. I guess none of you is completely new to uh, the world of webinars. Um, we're using this platform which allows an interaction with you because we have a Q&A box where you can send in questions which we want to answer after each session. So we have in total three sessions. We'll, we'll have a, uh, a Q&A session in about an hour and then another one towards the end of this meeting. So please feel free to send in your questions during the webinar. We will try to answer as many as possible and really make sure that we have an interaction with you as the audience. Um, I would also like to inform you that this webinar is being recorded. Um, we will make the webinar available on our website and of course the partners will share that information as well. So if you're not able to stay for the full length of the webinar, you can watch the recording later in a few days and we will of course uh, inform you with an email about the location, about the URL where you can access the recording again. And um, the following slide gives us a very quick overview um, again, about the functionalities, uh, please keep your microphone off, please keep your camera off. The speakers will only be visible when while they are speaking. And as I said, um, please put in your questions in this questions box, uh, which is available on the control panel of this webinar platform. And with that, I would like to move us to the agenda for today which should be visible on the next slide, wonderful. We're starting with a short introduction to codes and standards from the European perspective and the US perspective. 
And we're moving then into a session one on codes for new construction. And the second session will talk about standards for building renovation to transform the existing building stock. And in both sessions, we will again have one speaker from the US and one speaker from the EU so that we really always get both perspectives. And with that, I would already like to introduce our first speaker, who is Dimitrios Athanasiou. He's a policy officer for energy efficiency at DG Energy with the European Commission. Thank you very much for joining us uh, today, Dimitris. I know your camera is not working, but we know that your sound is working very well. And uh, we will share your slides. So you will give us an overview of European codes and standards and buildings and the work the European Commission in, is doing in that respect. Thanks again, Dimitris, for joining us. And I will hand over the virtual microphone to you now. Dimitris, I can currently not hear you. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, now I can hear you okay. very well. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, everybody, and happy new year to all of you. My name is Dimitris Athanasiu, and I'm a policy officer in DG Energy in the building team of the Energy Efficiency Unit. It is a great honor to be with you, and I will try to share the framework with regards to the energy codes and standards for buildings in the EU. Uh, our buildings are unique, of course, and they reflect the culture and history of our countries. But despite all the differences in climate, market, economic conditions, uh, construction, tradition, and so on, we can all learn from each other uh, as the basic principles are more or less the same. We need to reduce the energy demand. We need to integrate as much renewables and smart solutions as possible and take advantage of technological improvements. Before I start my presentation, I have to mention that buildings are very high in the political agenda. Uh, this is simply because buildings bring multiple benefits to the economy, the society, and the environment, and are very important for achieving our environmental and energy goals. The scope of the building sector today is much broader than it used to be some years ago. It is not only about improving the energy performance and energy savings, but it is also about health, energy poverty, affordable, affordable housing, sustainable living, integration of renewables, incorporating digital and smart solutions, creating jobs, etc. cetera. Uh, next slide, please. So some basic figures about the building sector in the EU. Uh, buildings are responsible for about 40% of the EU, EU's total energy consumption and 36% of its energy-related greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, due to a well-established legislative framework for the energy performance of buildings and products, new buildings today are much more efficient. However, existing buildings are very old and inefficient, and most of them will be standing by 2050. Almost 75% of the existing building stock in the EU is inefficient, and current renovation rates are only about one percent. Uh, buildings also have a big influence on EU citizens and households' economic conditions, as the quality and energy performance of buildings has a major impact on affordability of housing, and therefore, uh, low energy efficiency is one of the main causes of energy poverty. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, the the to the, the main instrument uh, for uh, uh, buildings in the EU is the energy performance of buildings directly. Initially, 
Uh, it was adopted in 2002, then amended in 2010 and in 2018. Uh, while at the moment we are also revising the directive to make sure that buildings are fit for our decarbonization uh, objectives, objectives and reflect the European Green Deal. But I will come back to that later. Uh, the, the, the EPPD, it is important to mention that uh, the buildings are also promoted by other pieces of legislation, such as the Energy Efficiency Directive, which, for example, sets uh, uh, requirements for public buildings, and also the EU Energy Labeling and Technical Designing legislation, which is about the uh, minimum standards for uh, products and, uh, uh, and energy labeling provides an indication of energy efficiency projects. Next slide, please. So the energy performance of buildings directive actually uh, uh, very, very quickly provides uh, a methodology for the calculation of energy performance and uh, also a, a methodology for setting cost optimal minimum energy performance standards for new buildings and existing buildings undergoing major renovation. Uh, major renovation means a renovation where the total cost of uh, the renovation is higher than 25% of the value of the building or more than 25% of the surface of the building envelope that, uh, of the building that undergoes renovation. Uh, the APPD, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive also uh, asks member states to set requirements and targets for uh, new buildings uh, as of 2020 uh, for uh, nearly zero energy buildings. Uh, it, uh, all new buildings must be nearly zero, nearly zero buildings from uh, January 2021. For public buildings, these requirements was already uh, uh, applied since uh, 2019. Uh, there are also other uh, provisions with regards to energy performance certificates that must be issued when a building is sold or rented, inspections of heating and system uh, uh, systems. Uh, but uh, you know, today I will try to focus on uh, uh, building codes and standards. Uh, it is important to to mention that the directive allows for a lot of flexibility in member states to reflect the national conditions, meaning the climate, the market uptake, the energy mix, the type of buildings, the construction methods, etc. Et uh, and it is also important to mention that the Commission has also established a set of standards and technical reports to support the EPPD called the Energy Performance of Building Standards, the EPB standards which is managed by the European Committee of Standardization. I think uh, Yap in uh, the following session will further uh, elaborate on, on this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, now, I mentioned before about this cost optimal methodology uh, that uh, EPPD requires uh, for member, provides that member states to develop this cost optimal calculation every five years to verify and update the minimum energy performance requirement in force. This is a very important step uh, in uh, the process of defining uh, minimum energy performance requirements. Uh, it's very demanding and very challenging process. It's uh, we don't have the time now to explain. Uh, uh, how this uh, uh, cost optimality uh, 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 reports are uh, are developed, but we start from some reference building, then some uh, energy efficiency measures, then that we also uh, calculate the energy demand and the uh, global calls for it, and then finally the uh, we calculate the 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 gap between the current and the existing minimum requirements, the requirements in force, and the, cal the, the, the requirements of the calculations. So if this gap is bigger than 15%, then 
member states must revise the minimum requirements. Uh, the first uh, cost of mal reports were submitted in 2013, and the second round came in 2018. The overall picture for these reports is that both for new and existing buildings, the choice of the cost of the, or cost of the methodology has been uh, quite efficient uh, uh, in setting uh, and steering existing national energy performance requirements. Uh, next step, please. Uh, similarly, uh, for nearly zero energy buildings, uh, uh, the, the EPPD provides that uh, member states uh, should make sure that all buildings are uh, NZEP by 2021. But uh, the EPPD defines that uh, nearly zero energy buildings is a building with high energy performance, uh, while the nearly zero or very low amount of energy required should be covered to a very significant extent by energy from renewables. Uh, here, the EBPD allows member states to have more flexibility on how to define the national requirements, uh, and they, it allows actually to reflect the national or regional or even local uh, conditions, but they need to include a numerical indicator for primary energy use expressed in kilowatt hours per square meter. In 2016, the Commission issued some recommendations for NZEP, and uh, here in this slide, uh, you can see what was, which were the, the, the benchmarks, the thresholds, if you want, that the Commission suggested for uh, different uh, climate uh, zones. It is important to understand that in, we, in, we published the uh, EPPD in 2010 and we asked member states to uh, actually apply uh, NZ requirements in 2021. Uh, the idea was that within this 10-year period the market would uh, evolve and uh, the cost uh, for constructing uh, NZ, uh, nearly zero energy building, would be actually becoming cost optimal. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here you can see a timeline for cost optimality and same requirements of the EPD. Actually, it starts well beyond. I could even start from, uh, from, from you know, the 1970s, where in Europe, most member states, because of the energy crisis, started to... To, to, to set requirements for installations for products. But in 2002, when the PPD came, the first PPD uh, was published, we started uh, having a more holistic approach, uh, asking member states to consider not just the insulation, but also uh, other issues like uh, um, technical building systems, renewables, and so on. Uh, we don't need to go into details into that, but uh, I just wanted you to know that it's a step-by-step -step approach towards a more holistic one. Next slide, please. Uh, here you can also see uh, uh, more or less what are the uh, average cost optimal levels uh, for new and existing buildings per climate zone. Uh, according to the 2018 cost optimal reports. And uh, uh, in the table below, you can see that uh, uh, the average reduction of these cost optimal levels from 2013 to 2018. For new buildings, most of cost optimal uh, points fell between 15 and 100 kilowatt hours with an average of 80 kilowatt hours. Uh, uh, square meter per year for residential and something like 140 kilowatt hours per square meter per year for the non-residential sector. 
For existing buildings, uh, it calls between 75 and 175 kilowatt hours, with an average of 130 kilowatt hours for the residential and 180 kilowatt hours per square meter per year for the non-residential sector. Next slide, please. Here you can also see uh, the improvement of residential minimum energy performance requirements in some key member states since the end uh, in force of the uh, first PPD in 2016. And you can see how we can gradually start it from higher uh, 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 standards uh, of, uh, with regards to primary energy use to uh, the situation today. Next slide, please. Uh, in 2018, we have uh, revised the directive again, but uh, uh, we didn't really touch uh, this, uh, uh, the provisions re uh, uh, relevant to the cost optimal, uh, but we tried to promote the energy performance of building standards, which was very important towards more transparency, uh, uh, on what's happening in member states. Uh, the, this, the, the revision of this directive also uh, revealed the broader scope of the energy performance of buildings directive towards, for example, a carbon metrics. Next slide, please. Some general remarks so far are that uh, NZ requirements are currently more or less 70% more ambitious than the national cost optimal minimum energy performance uh, requirements. And that was a progressive, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, approach uh, with uh, legislative, legislative steps uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are expecting a reduction of uh, uh, Cost of technology cost, for example, uh, costs related to photovoltaics, but other uh, costs uh, we expect to fall, and this will all further increase the level of ambitions for nearly zero energy buildings. But now the main challenge indeed is uh, to set uh, ambitious uh, uh, minimum requirements for existing buildings because this is. Uh, Without the renovation of the existing building stock, we won't achieve a decarbonized building stock by 2050. Uh, we should also keep in mind that we are also considering now uh, 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 solutions going to a bigger scale, like uh, or neighborhood or district level. Next slide, please. Um, Dimitros, thank you very much for for this overview so far. I think we will have to end here because otherwise we will uh, run into serious timing problems. I know you, you have quite a number of slides uh, also about the renovation activities and the policies implemented by the European Union, but I think you've given us a, an excellent overview already how the systematic increase of standards and, and codes and uh, well, the central decision um, made in Brussels and then the you know, the, the, the implementation in the member states has has changed over the years. And I think that's excellent. Let's, let's uh, park these other points later for the Q&A session, because otherwise we will run into problems. I know that some of the other speakers will go into some more detail about the standards you have just mentioned. And we'll also um, talk about uh, some of the policies uh, related to the renovation wave. So if it's okay uh, for you, yeah, I'd sure. like to to close here, thank you very much again. Of course, of course. And um, we would like to, we, I would like now uh, to move to the uh, US to invite uh, David Nemtsov, who is director at the Building Technologies Office with the US Department of Energy, um, to give us your high level overview, how building codes and standards have evolved in the US to have this parallel perspective to what we just heard from Dimitris on that topic. David, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Your slides will be on the screen. I can see you and hopefully also hear you in a moment. The floor is yours. You're on mute, David, sorry. Now, now you can hear me. Thank you. Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much, Oliver, and thank you uh, to your organization, BPIE, and to uh, IMT, 
uh, and the other sponsors of uh, today's webinar on this most important topic. Uh, I, I'm going to give you a, a, a brief overview of where things stand in the United States. I'm, I'm very glad to hear what Demetrius said about uh, the EU and the EPPD, not only because of the leadership that Demetrius and the um, Commission are playing, um, but because I, I will acknowledge that the United States, I think, has um, I'll say this, that the European Union, I think, is ahead of the United States uh, recently on the issue of uh, energy and uh, decarbonization-related building codes. Uh, we, um, in the U.S., we are going to, uh, we aim to narrow that gap and to pick up the pace of progress uh, in the United States. And I'm also active, I'll mention later, uh, with the International Energy Agency, and I know that uh, other jurisdictions besides the U.S. and the EU, Canada, Australia, uh, uh, Brazil, uh, Japan, and many other jurisdictions are also taking a fresh, aggressive look at building codes. And, and, and it's worth it. If, if, if you look at the name of, of my presentation, building codes uh, in the period, especially since the Paris Accord and the period where uh, climate change has uh, become a driving issue, I've taken on a new life. I'll call it a, a renaissance or a resurgence. So I'd like to talk about that and mostly focus on the uh, future of some trends. So if somebody uh, uh, would click for me, I would appreciate it. The most, uh, I think the most important thing, well, first I'll start with the national goals. So these are goals that were set by uh, President Biden uh, in the last year on uh, energy and climate. These are the, the broad goals that uh, help motivate uh, uh, U.S. action on the area, on the issue of building energy codes. Uh, uh, and these are the commitments that uh, the U.S. government has made and that we are working toward uh, and they're being implemented on a practical basis. But the, the key difference, uh, next please, between what uh, uh, the perspective from the United States and from the EU is that we have a federal system in the United States, and most of the action, you can't see this yet, you'll see it in a moment, most of the action in the United States does not occur at the national level. Uh, there's a lot of activities that we do. My agency, the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, has important roles, as you can see here. I'll tell you about those in a moment. But the important thing is that building codes, building energy codes, building codes in general, safety, a fire, of resilience in general and building energy codes in particular in the United States are primarily adopted by subnational governments. That, that principally means state governments as well as territorial. We have 50 states and several uh, uh, territories that have these responsibilities and also increasingly by local governments, by uh, cities and uh, county governments. And this, uh, this is interesting. Uh, the U.S. federal system was once described by a federal jurist as uh, 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 where states are the laboratory of democracy. And that is certainly the case with building energy codes where we see different actions. And you'll see a, a patchwork in a moment of different actions. So when I talk about the U.S. code, there is no U.S. code. There are model codes. There are federal actions. But most of the action is at the state and local level. And there, that's a, a key difference with the uh, EU. And, um, but it's something we share in common uh, with Canada, Australia, Brazil, and other uh, uh, federal uh, governmental systems. And uh, uh, it's key for the energy code. So you can see here that um, my department, the United States Department of Energy, uh, has three uh, major roles here on developing energy codes. Uh, we help develop model energy codes. These model energy codes are very important, but they exist just on paper. Until they're adopted by a jurisdiction with regulatory authority, they're merely that. They're just a model, but we help develop them. And there are uh, um, uh, commercial codes adopted by ASHRAE, particularly ASHRAE 90.1 for commercial buildings. There are residential codes primarily adopted by the uh, International Codes Council using the International Energy Conservation Code, the IECC. And we work, uh, develop, uh, doing technical analysis and providing input. Number two, we partner with those state and local governments to help them make decisions about code adoption uh, and implementation. And we encourage them to adopt the latest codes because of the enormous savings uh, uh, for their citizens. 
and we're working on this. But I'll focus a little more today on developing uh, uh, innovative uh, solutions looking forward. I'll come back to that. So just uh, we do directly regulate the U.S. government. Uh, Michael Friedberg, who will speak later, his agency and mine uh, work together to regulate manufactured housing. These are uh, residential structures made in a factory that are then shipped to location. Those are done at a federal level and federal buildings themselves. But most of the action, as I say, is at the state level and low. Next, please. And many of the thing, things I'll discuss, you'll also hear discussed from, uh, go back one, please. This has multiple clicks, for, all right, sorry, click forward. This has multiple clicks within here. There you go. So this is looking at, oh, see, got it. One back for me, please. This is a, a lively slide. So this is looking at the, um, uh, it, it doesn't translate well on the uh, webinar format, but I think you can see that there is a, a green, the green line is the residential code, the IECC over time. This is just an index to 100 on the left. It's not actual energy units. And there are the years on the right. It's lost the scale, but you can, you can see it on the graph itself. And then yellow, is the uh, our commercial codes and if you look at it from the 1970s to today you can see if you look at that index on the left that the model energy code is um twice as energy efficient or half uh, consumes half as much energy uh, uh uh per square foot for a model building than it did um uh in the 1970s uh, 45 years ago so this is a bit of a Rorschach test, a psychological test. You could say, oh, look at that progress we've made. And you'd be right on both commercial and residential that they are, uh, use half as much energy if they're built to the model code. But of course, uh, if we consider the, uh, challenge of climate change and, uh, curbing global emissions, the other side of the Rorschach test is how much is left to go. And you can see if you would click for me, please, that the trajectory that we would uh, like to see here focusing in uh, to try to get to zero net energy. That's what that should say, uh, which is where uh, I think we'd like to be. And you can see, uh, I'll come back to the size of the savings. So this is both, again, uh, progress made and progress that needs to be made on, on both model codes. And that's the model itself, not the adoption. Next, please. As I uh, referenced earlier, this is the residential code. There's a comparable map for the commercial code. In fact, I believe Amy might be showing that later, but either way, the, the point I'm trying to communicate, especially uh, to folks who aren't American, is this mix. And the, if you look on the right, you can see how current uh, the code is. And the more current the code is, the later the year the model code was developed, the more energy efficient it is uh, with better, strong requirements for Right for HVAC and insulation and uh, windows, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see this mix. And you can see some uh, where states are in terms of their adoption of the code. And um, if you notice a geographic pattern here, you're not imagining that. And uh, it tends to be along the, the Northeast and the West Coast. These are states that are generally more progressive, including energy issues. But then you also see some nice exceptions uh, in the middle there, Nebraska and Texas, uh, which have adopted aggressive codes. Texas did it not primarily for energy reasons, but for clean air reasons, for local clean air reasons, not climate or energy per se, but because the local air pollution in uh, Houston and the other major cities was so punishing, they needed to curtail um, their use of fossil fuels uh, in buildings. So you can see this mix, and um, again, uh, we're trying to increase it for uh, all the states, but this is a mix. Some states, you can see there in white, don't have a statewide code, and those codes are adopted, uh, if at all, at the uh, at the local level. So it's a real mix in the United States, uh, and, and similarly on commercial. Uh, next, please. So let me talk about some of the emerging themes that are going forward. And be happy to, when we have time for questions, to respond to any of these. This is what's going on in the U.S., but I know it's very similar conversation in Europe. You saw that on uh, one of Demetrius' slides, as well as uh, other jurisdictions. So I'll go through this very quickly. Um, the first one is getting more stringent, more insulation, getting to net zero energy. Uh, and you can see the goals uh, we're getting to. They're already there on a on an exemplary basis, but they they're not 
uh, adopted in enough places. Next one, very big issue in the United States is electrification or being ready for electrification. And, and we've seen jurisdictions act on both sides of these. Many uh, cities in the United States have, uh, for example, banned the use of natural gas in new uh, buildings. New York City, uh, the biggest city, of course, in the U.S., just adopted such a standard going forward. And now New York State is uh, significantly considering that. The governor of New York State just called for that the other day. On the other hand, so those are jurisdictions that want to ban uh, natural gas and oil use in buildings for carbon reasons in the future for new buildings. On the other hand, 20 states at the state level have banned their cities from adopting such measures. So as I say, it's a tense uh, and exciting discussion on electrification. There are increasing jurisdictions that are requiring electric vehicle charging, typically for commercial buildings or multifamily buildings. And again, it could be ready for EVs, meaning pre-wiring, or some jurisdictions are calling for actually putting in a certain number of chargers. Similarly, for photovoltaics or for storage, more and more jurisdictions, notably California, are requiring the adoption of photovoltaics for new construction for, for certain buildings, including single-family homes, the California case. Grid integration, very important issue uh, to uh, uh, for whether it's uh, smart thermostats or grid interactive equipment so that the equipment itself can uh, be responsive to grid needs and can help uh, integrate uh, renewables. Uh, more and more codes are looking at having a carbon basis, not an energy basis. This one's a tough one because we understand what it means uh, to uh, limit or eliminate natural gas or heating oil to reduce carbon. The harder part is if if a building uses electricity, one can't be sure where that electricity comes from, whether it comes from a, a carbon-free source or a carbon-based source. But more and more jurisdictions in the U.S. want codes to focus as a carbon tool more than an energy tool. Performance-based codes are ones that are less prescriptive and that uh, give the uh, home builder or the office builder more options. And uh, more and more on the next bullet, we're seeing a focus on compliance. It's one thing to develop a model code. It's another thing to adopt it. More importantly, is to actually see compliance from the builders, and that uh, has a, always been a challenge. We'll continue to do so. Luckily, there are some new technologies available and plain old training to help people meet those standards. And finally, for existing buildings, and Amy Boyce will talk about this, is a new policy tool called Building Performance Standards. So I'll just use that as a teaser for Amy. Real quick, please, if you could click, and I'm almost done. Um, uh, I'll let's save this for Amy. One more click for me. I just want to put in a sales pitch here uh, for the Building Energy Codes Working Group that I co-chair through the IEA. Here's the contact information. We welcome, uh, uh, even if you're not a national representative, we welcome the participation of experts. Here's the contact. Finally, on the last slide, here is my contact information as well as uh, my office. And so, again, thank you, Oliver, and your colleagues for organizing this discussion. Thank you very much, David. Uh, wonderful overview. And uh, I just wanted to point out, uh, you know, the, in the end, the structure of implementation, uh, the, the challenge to implement implement codes and standards is not that different between the US and uh, the EU, because the member states of the European Union also have the ultimate say how they decide and how they implement their national standards. And that's equivalent to the, to the states level in, in the US. So I think we, we have a lot of parallel challenges here. And it's it's excellent to, uh, to see also the progress uh, the U.S. has made over time in the in the development of the model code, and it's also quite interesting to see that map uh, where some states in the U.S. implement the latest model codes, whereas other states are running a few years behind. So it's uh, it's we have a similar situation, I think, in in the European Union if we were to look at the individual member states. But thanks a lot, David, again for for joining us. We're now going to dive into some more technical details. Um, in this next session, uh, we will have two speakers and we will focus in particular on the building codes for new construction. We will have Amy Boyce, who is with IMT, and we will have Jaap Hocheling afterwards. But first in line is Amy. Amy, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Amy is an
Associate Director of Codes and Technical Strategy at the Institute for Market Transformation, the partner with whom we're organizing this series. Um, Amy, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the floor is yeah. yours. Thank you. Um, do you have the present? There we go. <laughs> thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, good morning or afternoon, uh, depending on where you are joining from. Uh, thank you for uh, participating and joining me for this discussion on codes and how they set the baseline for lifetime building performance. Uh, today, I will provide a brief introduction to US model codes, uh, which has been uh, referenced by, by David just previously, and talking a little bit about compliance methods and how, those, how the initial estimated and measured building performance before and post occupancy need to be considered with the introduction of building performance standards, um, often referred to as BPS. I will also touch upon the effect that differences in jurisdictional authority and policies may have on this relationship between codes and building performance standards and how BPS must be considered in the design and construction process. Finally, I'll discuss how it's critical that the codes incorporate more recent tools used to address decarbonization, such as those, again, that David just mentioned, and how they are important to be incorporated within the design and construction process. Next slide, please. First, a little bit about the Institute for Market Transformation. We are a nonprofit located in Washington, DC, and our aim is to catalyze widespread and sustained demand for increased building performance by advancing policies and business practices that enable people to build and operate healthy, high-performing buildings. Next slide, please. Now, on to the codes. As David mentioned, in the US, there is no national code. The majority of code adoption occurs at the state level, with some exceptions. And there are model codes on which the state and local codes are based. For commercial properties, the official model code by statute is ASHRAE 90.1, uh, whose official title is Energy Standard for Buildings Except Low-Rise Residential Buildings, which is quite a mouthful. And then for residential buildings, it is the International Energy Conservation Code, or the IECC. In practice, the commercial version of the IECC is often adopted, with 90.1 used as a compliance option. Next slide, please. Buildings comply with the energy code by one of two paths, prescriptive or performance. The prescriptive path is basically a checklist of minimum requirements that must be met in all categories. The prescriptive path is a simpler option and it often appeals to smaller buildings or those with less complex systems. The performance path, on the other hand, requires an energy model and compares the estimated performance of the proposed building with that of a minimally compliant structure, producing an estimated percentage increase in efficiency over the baseline. This path allows some trade-offs between different elements, provided the overall estimated performance level is achieved. Next slide, please. So why is this important? So modeling for code or compliance modeling, as described on the previous slide, is designed to compare alternative options. Oh, sorry, I think we were one slide ahead. <laughs> There we go, thank you. Um, sorry about that. Uh, it's designed to compare uh, alternative options and it's also not as accurate as a prediction tool, though it is discussed as a, um, as a model and, and the performance that results from that. So in this method, the modeler creates two models, a baseline building based on the minimum code requirements for that particular building type, size and location, and the proposed building, which has the same fundamental characteristics but improved elements related to envelope, lighting, HVAC, et cetera. The key output in this case is the percent improvement above code. So this estimated performance may not match the eventual measure performance for many reasons, such as accuracy of the model and inputs or variances in construction versus design, but the most common and impactful reason is how buildings are operated, schedules, temperature set points, occupancy levels, et cetera. Much of this is either unknown initially or changes after occupancy. So as we move towards the adoption and implementation of building performance standards, the accuracy of the building model and the subsequent operations of the building become more important as the measure performance will now be held to a standard, one that the code compliance model is not necessarily meant to predict. 
while it is possible to more accurately gauge future performance with models designed for that purpose, variances still exist. Next slide, please. So I've referenced and David referenced before building performance standards. So what are they? Well, building performance standards require direct action by building owners to meet city or state mandated performance improvement targets for their property. These targets become stricter over time, driving continuous long-term improvement in the building stock. Codes as applied to existing buildings require building or system elements to meet current requirements, but they're narrow in scope and only take effect at discrete times and for discrete elements. BPS require greater changes, but allow building owners broad flexibility to use whatever technologies and operational standard strategies that they decide are most effective and economical to meet the target. So updates are still subject to code compliance. All BPS consists of three main elements. The metric used to measure performance, such as greenhouse gas emissions or site energy, the target that the building or type of building need to achieve, and the path that they use to get there. Next slide, please. You just saw this, uh, this map before. Um, and this shows the building performance standards that have been currently adopted in the US. So as you can see from here, relatively few cities and states currently have a building performance standards on the books, but we expect that number to grow very rapidly in the next several years. Additionally, while most codes are adopted at state level, building performance standards have initially gained much more traction in local and city governments. Next slide, please. Though related, codes and BPS have key differences. Energy codes primarily address design and new construction, while BPS focus on existing buildings. As mentioned, there may be differences in the jurisdictions in which they are adopted and implemented, and by which government departments they are enforced. BPS are less widely adopted than codes, at least right now, but they're also a newer policy tools that allows for more flexibility as they come online. Next slide. So while there are many differences, energy codes and building performance standards are looking to both achieve energy and carbon reduction in the built environment and together cover the building life cycle all the way up through them or up to demolition. After all, a new building becomes an existing building what's occupied. With both codes and BPS, state and local authorities have the discretion to set standards specific to their community and are responsible for the ultimate success of the policies. Next slide. So this map is the commercial version of the map that you saw previously. Um, and um, it is also courtesy of DOE. This map here shows the effective code that's in place in each state in the US on the commercial side. The gray states have no statewide code, while the version of the code adopted in the remaining states varies widely, with some states referencing code language um, as much as 15 years old. On the commercial side shown here, there are a, the updates are a little bit more recent um, than you see on the residential side, but it's also important to note that the code version shown here does not necessarily reflect the same year that might be referenced in the state statute. As mentioned before, the IECC and 90.1 are model codes, meaning that the states are not bound to use them, and they may even strengthen or weaken individual components of the code, resulting in variances from that particular version of the model code. As more cities begin to adopt BPS policies, this sets up the potential for misalignment between new construction and existing building standards, as the code requirements for new construction may not properly set buildings up for the performance required just a few years after initial occupancy. While BPS do not call out specific requirements for individual building elements, building performance is dependent on the requirements established by the code and less stringent codes generally result in buildings that use more energy. Additionally, some building elements are more difficult to replace than others. For example, a weak building envelope could possibly set the, could possibly set the limit for building's performance over its lifetime, making BPS compliance much more difficult in the long run. Next slide, please. In addition to the jurisdictional divide between codes and BPS, there may also be a gap between the departments that administer these policies. Codes, including those governing mechanical, electrical, plumbing, et cetera, in addition to energy, are often enforced through a dedicated buildings department 
but that BPS may not be included, in, but BPS may not be part of that same department. Instead, it's possible that BPS is administered through a division that also handles um, generally energy and sustainability and also has responsibilities outside the built environment. Next slide, please. Again, this graph is a similar version to what you saw previously and shows the progression of the Commercial Energy Code from 1975 to 2019 and indicates the additional steps that need to be taken to achieve net zero new construction by 2030. The assumed limits of efficiency are also shown here with the need for advanced measures and renewables indicated by the dotted lines. When it comes to new construction, the path we need to take is pretty clear, if not easy, but the newest codes are only affecting a portion of new buildings, as we saw from those previous maps, and new buildings are only a portion of the built environment. Similar in, to the EU, um, I believe it is about one to one and a half percent of buildings that are being replaced. So there is a strong um, component of existing buildings that will still be around in the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years. So not only do we need steady code improvements and an increase in new code adoption, but we also need to address those buildings that are already built. Next slide, please. Ultimately, though both energy codes and building performance standards, through both energy codes and building performance standards, we are aiming to decarbonize the built environment. While codes mainly regula regulate energy efficiency, their scope is expanding to cover things such as renewable energy, electrification, and demand management, which will be necessary to achieve net zero new construction. Unfortunately, relatively few areas have adopted these expanded scopes, resulting in missed opportunities to incorporate these elements at the new construction stage when it is both simpler and less costly. Building electrification, for instance, is much more easily incorporated into a building at construction when the necessary infrastructure can be installed either in place of or alongside fuel systems. Delaying the inclusion of electric and electric ready measures into the code will have significant repercussions down the road as greater renovations will be required for buildings that do not have the necessary infrastructure in place. Hopefully, the combined efforts of stronger new codes to establish a high performance potential and the enactment of BPS to make sure that those buildings are meeting that potential will have the necessary impact on the built environment that we need to achieve our climate goal. Next slide. So thank you very much for having me here and that for this discussion on codes and their relationship to building performance standards and the relationship between new construction and existing buildings. For more information, you can go to imt.org slash BPS or energyefficientcodes.org. Thanks. Thank you very much, Amy, for this uh, realistic and to a certain degree also sobering uh, presentation and <laughs> overview. That's very helpful. I've already received some questions from the audience, but we'll park them until we've heard from Jaap Hogeling, who is our next speaker, and who will talk about the European energy performance of building standards, uh, the standards which Dimitris, our first speaker, already hinted at. So you will talk in more detail about the development of these standards and how they're being applied in the different uh, jurisdictions in Europe. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. The floor is yours. Thank you, Oliver. Um, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words on uh, the modular set of EPB standards and the use of these standards in new and existing buildings. Um, next slide, please. Um, well, my background is I'm a, a chair of uh, CENTIC 371 Energy Performance of Buildings, a coordinating uh, CENTIC on, uh, that oversees the development of uh, those standards, uh, more than 50 standards, and uh, as such, also participating in the work of uh, several uh, European uh, CENTICs and uh, ISO TCs. Um, in this presentation, I also refer to uh, several videos and webinars we published at the EPB Center website. The EPB Center is, is organized uh, to support uh, the knowledge around the 
energy performance of building standards. Next slide. The set of standards. Um, well, I, I want to clarify a little bit about, uh, I'm talking about standards and, and these this, uh, sessions are about codes and standards and how I see uh, the difference. Uh, the set of energy performance of building standards describe a normative way of uh, assessing the energy performance of buildings. It is up to the regulating authorities to lay down codes or regulations, how to refer to these standards and provide the national policy choices connected to the use of these standards. So the, um, the set of standards are, the standards are really performance based. So we don't describe in these standards requirements on products or requirements uh, on buildings. We just give the procedures how to assess the energy performance. So the, they are functional. It works for all types of buildings and systems, new and existing. They are sensitive. It uh, reacts to all available options and encloses both new and old uh, technologies to support a, also the renovation evaluation for existing buildings, which is, of course, the, one of the most important tasks we have. And they are usable. It has a clear data input description. It is adaptable to the context and they are, they provide suitable results for its scope, compliance with the uh, energy performance requirements as, uh, as uh, required in, uh, in building regulations and energy performance display. So the energy uh, performance certificates that uh, will be uh, on the the re result of the total assessment uh, procedure. On next slide, please. They are modular. It means uh, you have uh, modules that describe how to uh, calculate the, the energy needs, how to assess the energy use of systems, the connecting generation and energy carrier and finally you weigh that to the energy performance of the building uh, next slide please and this is resulted in the set of standards in in this slide you see um well the most important ones there are more but it, this is the philosophy you first have to calculate the energy need of a building, new or existing, by the ENISO 52016. And this is based, of course, on input values, also described in several standards, the, the, the heat gain standards and the building fabric properties, the climate conditions and the internal environmental requirements. They are the input to this energy need calculation. <clears throat> and then the output is data that you need to do the energy use calculation for the systems for cooling, ventilation, heating, domestic hot water and lighting. And of course you have to uh, to express that in uh, in the energy use by different carriers and that has to be converted to primary energy use as described in the overarching standard the ISO 52000 and finally the post processing uh, that is expressed <coughs> at the uh, energy certificates next slide please so why this modularity um, it's a real advantage because uh, all the modules uh, are have the same property uh, and the same internet internal organization and structure so if you know one of the standards you understand easily the others and you can easily replace one module by another and you can even uh, use uh, special modules that you uh, prefer on certain applications at, at national or regional level. Next. So the structure is, uh, the, is organization of the contents of the uh, energy performance of building standards. 
uh, and the related technical reports because the standards only contain normative text but the explanation justifications to understand it is given in the technical reports the standards they also include an annex uh, a and b and that mechanism is included in the standards to make it flexible to make it adaptable to the building regulations in different countries because of uh, different uh, um, conditions or different uh, uh, culture um, and different uh, uh, other building regulations so annex b includes all data you need to to use the standard uh, default data but member states uh, regulators can choose for some other data or uh, other levels of simplification and they can express that <coughs> in a table in annex a which is an empty table so this is the structure and then finally we i'm sorry Um, sorry, yeah. Uh, do you still hear me? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, please continue. Yeah, it's okay. Um, so um, the uh, structure is uh, of the input data is as, as follows. You have a, a group of product data, of course, you need for the calculation procedure. Uh, you have uh, the system design data and you have the operational conditions and the, and some constants and other data you have to include to run the standard. The structure is also uh, uh, clearly uh, presented in an Excel file, which is freely available through our website to show uh, how the assessment procedure and calculation procedure works, which is very helpful for software developers. And also to demonstrate that the interconnection of the different uh, standards works. Next slide. The, uh, the these slides uh, gives a little bit of picture of it uh, as an, uh, for a simple example for heating systems. You ha you have an, a module input in the center, <clears throat> which is just to uh, once in when you start, and uh, you need the product data. And then you have in each time step of the calculation, you have the module input and you have the module output. And the module output could be connected to another uh, module, another uh, uh, system in, in the building. So this is the, the structure of the calculation. The next slide, I say it in a different way. If you have, for, for example, a heating system, <clears throat> with domestic cold water, you of course you need uh, to know about the needs and distribution and the storage of cold water. Then the heat pump has to calculate that and also take into account the heating or cooling load of that building. And finally, uh, calculate the heat, heating performance and, and the output for heating. If uh, if you have a backup power boiler, you have to. Uh, to check this and then going down uh, if there is a cooling uh, request uh, you have to take this standard into account but finally you get the overall energy performance so this is the way how the different modules are connected next slide um, so it looks very diff very complicated but it is uh, for the front end so the user of uh, the software or the program or the set of standards, not that difficult. He only sees uh, uh, what's actual needed to use the method. So describing the conf conf configuration of the buildings and the system, inputting the data about uh, all building elements and system components, describing uh, the operation of the buildings and the system and understanding the calculation and the indicators. For the back end, of course, uh, for those who design those uh, methods and they have to understand the structure of the modules and how to combine and link them uh, to uh, databases of product uh, catalogs and so on. 
and defining in a calculation structure that the software proof and easy to adapt to the actual building and system configuration. Next slide. So the conclusion is that uh, this set of module uh, EPD standards uh, and systems uh, are more and more various and complex and the interactions between the building and uh, building envelope and the technical systems are more and more relevant uh, in both ways. So a clear module structure allows to adapt the calculation to the actual case. It is a real challenge to define a general structure to connect all modules in a smooth way. And there is a, there is a concern, of course, for the standard developers, but also a challenge for the software developers. The structure issue is not seen by the end, end users. The flexibility, the flexible structure allows him to describe a large variety of situations. And in the next slide, I will say only a fair few words. Well, um, it is already explained that we have a revision of the EPPD and uh, does it affect the use of this uh, set of EPPD standards that was used in most European countries for, let's say, say 70, 80, 90% depends on the countries. Yes, I think it is uh, clear that the references in the, in the new EPD are stronger. Next slide, I say a few yep. words. Um, on... Yep, I, I, know, I know you have to, to leave because you have to go to another meeting and I have some very pertinent questions to you um, okay. because um, if, I, if I could slot them in, um, if that was okay, so that we make sure that we have the time to, to address these questions. So th thank you very much, first of all, for uh, the overview and showing the complexity how the EPBD standards work. Um, there is a question from the audience which was asking, well, how, how complex is it actually for the European member states to adapt these standards to national or regional uh, conditions? And um, what is the experience gained so far? Can, can you talk about that? Yes, well, I, I agree it is uh, com complex at a certain level because uh, uh, many member states, they have uh, building regulations, uh, including uh, perhaps sometimes definitions that are not in line with the current standards. So let's say if, uh, if you have uh, requirements formulated in such a way on ventilation or on indoor environment, which are not uh, compatible uh, with the definitions we give, they have to, uh, to think about how to address this. And that is an effort for regulators, as you know, because regulators are very depending on experts and, and the experts are not always uh, very uh, interesting in in uh, well uh, consulting all the text we produce in the centers mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I i know it is a challenge in in several countries uh, we uh, we had discussions about the level of uh, implementation and um, some countries uh, uh, they say well we just take them as they are and that's it but there are well the uh, you could say the Western European countries with more experience and a longer uh, history of building regulations, they are the diff most difficult ones because they have their own own traditions. And yeah. but yes, it's, uh, if you ask me how many European countries take them took them over, I think it is about half of them uh, on, on a level of uh, 80, 90 percent. And there are the other half is perhaps in, in a lower range. But yeah. And, and, and those who have taken them on board, who are implementing them, um, how are they enforcing the national implementation in their, in their national jurisdiction? How are, in, how are they enforcing that these buildings performance standards are, are really met? Can you, can you give one or two examples of maybe a, a really good um, enforcement and, and, and compliance monitoring uh, system? Yes, well, there are uh, most countries who uh, took them over in the, in the last uh, few years in past, uh, that are past, they used the uh, immensely approach, which makes it a little bit easier to understand. Uh, we, pr we promote an hourly uh, calculation step that 
And what they did is they um, contracted a party, a research institute or, uh, or universities to develop a software to help the user to address these standards. So mm -hmm. that's what they did. Because uh, you cannot ask uh, the normal professional to uh, run through 52 standards. Uh, so what they did is they developed software that is for for 95% based on all these standards. And, and that product is put on the market and that is the basis for their energy performance requirements according to the regulation. And okay. that's also something we we promoted to, to uh, develop for uh, for Europe in general, uh, a software kernel that meets it so that uh, uh, it's more easy to access uh, the set of standards. Okay, thank you very much, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, Amy, are you still there? Hopefully you can hear me because I've also received some questions from the audience uh, for you. Um, but maybe while, while we make sure you're there. Yes, wonderful, thank you very much, Amy. Um, and well, it's actually a question to both of you. Can you just quickly answer um, whether the 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 codes and standards we've been uh, hearing about today uh, in the EU and the US are they approaching a passive house level at all? Maybe Amy, if you can answer first, what what's your what's your opinion on on that? Um, we are not quite there um, as we have been pushing the um, and and looking at the new um, the new versions of the model code they are getting closer some stretch codes in areas are really where that that might start to approach that level um, and those are stretch codes are specific um, above the model code areas that are generally optional that are that are adopted by individual jurisdictions. Um, and some elements of them may may start to get close to that, but I think um, we're still a little bit away. The the envelope has been um, a real, you know, a big a big sticking point, a big issue um, in terms of you know progress. And there were significant improvements made in the last version of the model code in terms of strengthening, um, tightening, and also with the the windows um, better without the better internal or uh, entire envelope, but um, we still have a little bit to go to get to those levels uh, as of yet. Yes, well, Sorry, in, yeah. what's the situation in Europe? Yeah. Yes, in Europe, uh, I could say that the energy performance standards don't have any difficulty with that uh, because we don't, uh, you can use any property of a building to do your assessment procedure. So passive buildings is not a problem for our our procedures also can uh, handle uh, zero energy buildings. It's, uh, it's not a problem. Okay, um, I actually also received a, a quick question for David if he's still with us and, and can hear me but while we make sure that David is, is there. Um, I have another uh, question Amy, um, to you also because you just mentioned the the envelope and the envelope requirements get stricter. So that leads to more, um, well, it, it leads to some challenges concerning indoor air quality, for example. Yap already um, explained that um, the European standards really take care of, of that aspect. Is that also the case in, in the US? Are there, is, is indoor environment quality, indoor air quality, ventilation, uh, a stringent requirement um, of the of the model codes and how these model codes are being implemented in some of the state jurisdictions. So, um, in the U.S. codes, ventilation is generally um, handled with the the mechanical code. So there are there are um, and that is also um, based on an ASHRAE standard. So there are um, fairly strict. Um, requirements. However, it's very prescriptive. There is not a lot of um, monitoring available yet. There is some movement, um, especially as this the last couple of years, as there's been an increased focus on the indoor air quality and how that contributes to transmissions of um, viruses and other issues. There have been some movements towards looking at um, measuring the air quality and tracking that. 
Um, it's also something that, um, at least at, at IMT, we've started to work on and promote in terms of um, in terms of the, the building performance standards and encouraging um, building owners to or you know jurisdictions to set up standards and then and then subsequently building owners to monitor their indoor air quality to make sure that these these elements are um, are you know are being met. But it is definitely a concern again as you 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 look at this trade off between having the energy and and where that goes. But again, the code is also um, starting to require you know. Um, key energy recovery, and that's certainly a um, technical tactic that has been able to, you know, meet those energy requirements while increasing ventilation. So um, those, it's it's held from a lot of different areas, and I think, you know, there's really been a, a renewed focus on it recently, and I'm hoping that that continues in the in the future. And again, that that becomes a performance requirement too, not just a prescriptive um, number to, to put out there. Okay, thanks a lot, Amy. Uh, David, I see you now. Thanks uh, for, for joining us again. Just a, a very quick final question for this uh, first round of, of Q&A. Um, David, the question is, um, when some states adopt a version of the IECC, which you talked about earlier, do they, or do they have the freedom or do they actually modify it in terms of reducing efficiency requirements or, or what's, what's the situation on the ground? I'm sorry, Oliver, how many hours do I have to respond to this question? So I the answer is seconds, to be honest. <laughs> the answer is absolutely yes. And what we see is uh, they, yes, some adopt it wholesale and just take it and photocopy it, to use an old term, cut and paste it. Uh, but others typically a uh, modified, typically they will weaken a provision or two, either because they believe their situation is different or they have some uh, local uh, interests and some are increasingly strengthening it with terms and uh, with, with additional items. And one of the things I mentioned earlier where my department is helping to provide support on photovoltaics or storage or grid interactivity, we're, we're providing, I'll call them plug-in modules so that a jurisdiction can take the, uh, the model code and then plug in uh, a PV or a storage or, or an EV section so that they can strengthen it. So it's, we've seen every every permutation, every every shade. Okay, great, thank you. And I just got another question in here uh, sent in by my support team in the background. So I, I want to um, actually ask that uh, both to Amy and, and you, David, and, and maybe Yap, you can give us your perspective also how it worked in Europe. The question is, can this EU, uh, US cooperation help foster a, a more comprehensive framework of codes and standards in the US? Um, do, you, do you think that there's something that the experience in Europe can help uh, the US here to advance? And maybe the question to you later, Jaap, is how difficult was it to get to the stage where Europe is right now? But um, Amy, do you do you want to try and tackle this first? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, as David mentioned, the EU is ahead of where uh, the US is, and I think seeing that um, is helpful. Um, they're also very different areas, and especially in terms of climate, and that comes up a lot. Um, I think as you know, we look at the existing buildings and, and measuring performance. That's really a a useful area where I think there's there's more potential for for alignment and for for looking toward um, you know the lessons learned um, because once you get to this performance level you're not you're not focused as much on the individual elements of the building that may be different based on your um, you know based on the climate or just based on you know culture where these things may be um, misaligned so I think I think there's definitely something that we we I think in general we should be looking there. I think the best, the most potential is again on the performance side and kind of and looking at things holistically. So um, that's where I would I would see it being the most um, the most potential for alignment. Thanks, Amy. David, what's your take? Yeah, I, th I think uh, uh, Oliver, you asked a, a bit of a technical question and a bit of a religious question on this one, and so on on and and I'll let you yeah, speak to uh, European religions, but uh, the American religion right now on this, I, I think we see a lot of 
a lot of differences. Look, I, I, in general, the jurisdictions are moving forward, but the 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 um, the differences and the variety among the different parts of the U.S. I think will continue to grow and not shrink. Even if they all move forward, they can move forward at different paces. In particular, this uh, issue of existing buildings, whether it's through a building performance standard or some other policy intervention, this will have a lot of appeal to key jurisdictions. I mentioned New York City and now New York State, Boston, these other major areas, but for much of the U.S., it, it, it won't be appealing for uh, for their foreseeable future. So I, I think the variances will continue to stay strong. I'm, I'm sorry to say, but we're gonna have, we're gonna do everything we can to provide. You know, we, we I think we all know. We heard it today uh, from Demetrius on Ford. Once you do the math on building codes, it's very encouraging. You just need yeah. to get somebody to do the math. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Your final yes. verdict. Yeah. Well, I I, I agree. Uh, it is a sort of religion also. <laughs> because uh, in in Europe uh, we decided, I think many years ago, that standards should be performance based and not prescriptive. I think that is the fundamental difference. Uh, of course, the the, the building uh, our our target group, the builders, the, the building designers, uh, they will be happy with uh, a certain level of with uh, prescriptive base because then you only have to look at tables and and make it uh, very simple. But in Europe, there is a, a huge priority in uh, in design, in uh, architecture, also in application of technical solutions. So the performance-based standards uh, are more logical for, for the European tradition in, in building and in designing uh, systems in buildings. Um, I think that is the uh, fundamental difference uh, between uh, what I know from the US and from 90.1 and, and that sort of standards. And I also plead at the uh, ASHRAE level to, uh, well, to make the step to a performance based standards. And it's much better for, for innovation and for developing new technology. And, uh, and gives the industry much more flexibility in finding solutions. But the market has to be happy with it. And that's uh, the religious part of it, you, you could say. They have to be uh, trained to use performance-based standards because it, it's not easy. You have to think about it. and You cannot just look at tables and figures. Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Without the construction industry, we won't be able to implement those uh, standards. David, did you want to make another comment? I just, I just want to, I just want to underscore my agreement on, on Yap's last point. It is so frustrating that that we help, we all collectively help design performance-based standards to give builders more flexibility. But in the U.S., only about 10% of new buildings are built using performance rather than prescriptive based. And most of those are in California, or much of those are in California. It's a source of great frustration, Yap, in the US. I agree, we need training, but I, it, I think it has to be the wave of the future. So we're gonna continue pushing here as, as I hope you do in Europe. Okay, and maybe that's a topic for a future exchange uh, between the EU and the US to you know dive into the details, how you make the performance based uh, standards uh, Oliver, I, really I think happen and accept it on the ground, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. I think the I have secret to, to our jobs, and let me just say for BPIE and IMT and the other, is to figure out how to replicate the experience elsewhere. Not copy it directly, because it doesn't always take root in the new environment, but to replicate it for the new environment. I think it's a very important role. Okay, excellent. Well, thank, thank you, you uh, all three uh, for being available for this Q&A session. I know you have other commitments and I know uh, that we're running late a little bit, but it was really useful to have this conversation and have the questions answered. So thank you again. I now want to move us very quickly to the next session where we talk about standards for building renovation. And um, we now have a little bit of a challenge to really stick to, to the time um, because we're running late, but maybe we can go a little bit over time because I definitely want to give the allotted, uh, the allocated 10 minutes to e each of the speakers. And I already see a little bit of a typo here on the screen because uh, the first speaker, 
is Louise Sunderland. Thank you very much, Margot, for changing that so quickly. So our next speaker is Louise Sunderland from the Regulatory Assistance Project, or short RAP. And uh, thanks for joining us, Louise. Today, you will talk about the use of minimum energy performance standards to renovate Europe's existing buildings. And you will talk about the most recent plans and announcements of the European Commission on this topic. Louise, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Oliver. And um, yes, I get to talk about the existing buildings, which really are the majority, certainly in Europe, the majority of the buildings that will still be standing, the vast majority of buildings that will still be standing in 2050. So, you know, a huge area of concentration. I think that that point's been made a number of times now. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to pick up actually where um, Demetrius left off. He was saying when he left off the, the presentation of the uh, um, work by the European Commission on the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, that we have now in front of us this huge challenge to improve the performance of existing buildings. Uh, doing this through increasing the renovation rates for, um, that the Commission has targets to set the, the has set targets to increase the renovation rate, but also increase the depth of renovation, increase the ambition of each renovation when um, when they happen. And so, as Demetrius said, the, the Commission's approach, um, as now proposed in the um, new Energy Performance of Buildings Directive that we just saw the draft of in December, the proposed, proposed approach is to introduce minimum energy performance standards. Um, to do this and you know very simply uh, minimum energy performance standards are regulations that require existing buildings to meet a, a minimum performance standard at a point in time or a trigger point in their building life cycle and when we have seen these used um, in practice um, uh, when we talk about the, the backstop date, um, the, the point in their building life cycle, very often we are seeing a firm date being used in advance of which a natural building life cycle trigger points are used. So you might introduce a standard that requires buildings to um, achieve uh, the desired performance in 2030, but in advance of that, you'll introduce the standard gradually by, by asking those buildings to be renovated to the standard when they are sold, for example, or when they are renovated for other reasons, or when they are rented out. So um, MEPS are, are, have a lot of similarities with building performance standards that Amy was talking about in the US. Um, lots and lots of uh, different designs actually nationally in the US, in the, the EU, also actually in Australia and New Zealand, we're seeing these kind of standards that apply to the existing buildings uh, being designed. Lots of different ways of designing them, but each design uh, is formed of these, these, these three basic elements, which is you choose the buildings that you would like to target. Um, that might be a sector, um, a, a tenure, a building type even. Then, of course, um, the standard itself uh, needs to be defined. So you need to ha establish how the standard will be defined and what level of the ambition uh, of ambition you're setting. And then, of course, um, the trigger point at which the standard uh, is to be set, as I've said. Uh, next slide, please. And, um, and of course, we have now a very exciting uh, uh, development within the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, which is to actually propose the introduction of these kinds of standards across all of Europe. And that really is actually a, a huge step, as I, I think we'll see in a minute. Um, just to summarise, uh, give a, a brief summary of, of this uh, proposal text that we see here, it um, it does apply to all buildings, which is really interesting, really important. It's very clear in its design that the Commission is looking at the worst performing stock. This is really very, very focused on those very worst performing buildings. Of course, these are the buildings that use most energy per, uh, per metre squared. They are um, obviously then uh, have very high costs to run, um, and they also contribute significantly to the problem of energy poverty that we have across Europe. We do find low income households do tend to live in these worst performing buildings, generally poorer quality, um, poorer state of repair. So you get this kind of nexus of low income and, and high energy costs and that's a really significant consideration at the moment um, particularly in Europe and, and one that the Commission I think is taking quite seriously. So we see all buildings being covered really close focus on uh, the worst performing. Um, also importantly to note that this framework um, draws very heavily on and relies on the existing framework that has been built up, up now over the couple, last couple of decades uh, through the directive of energy performance certificates and this is the um, 
system of building assessment and labeling in Europe. So that is and an, an abbreviated here on this slide is EPC, Energy Performance Certificate, but really, really important to underpin the introduction of these standards. So what are the proposals? Um, the, proposals the proposals are for non-domestic buildings for the very worst um, performing. So those in the EPC scale of A to G that are on the worst performing G bands to be uh, improved to the next band up, the F, by 2027, and then those um, Fs to be improved to E by 2030. Very similar framework for domestic buildings, just shifted three years uh, forward in terms of those um, uh, compliance dates. Next slide, please. Um, just very briefly um, to uh, recap on this importance of this underpinning uh, building assessment, building labelling framework that's been built up um, in Europe over a lot of years. Well, I'm aware of time, so I won't go too much into this, but, I, but obviously uh, there are some some key enablers here that not only the the, the, asset, the building assessments have been done, but that contributes to stock data being built up at a national level. That contributes, obviously, the user-friendly label that, um, that can be used to uh, communicate a standard to building owners. Lots of really important kind of foundational pieces in the Energy Performance Certificate Framework, but also very important here to um, really focus on what which metrics, which the assessment uh, approach behind this energy performance certificate framework. It isn't entirely the same across uh, every country of Europe. There's a framework within which member states have defined their own um, um, performance, uh, um, uh, energy performance assessments. But what's really important here is that when we start using this assessment and this label to define a minimum energy performance uh, uh, standard, then it becomes all the more important that that assessment is actually pointing towards the future renovations that, that, um, that we want to have. Uh, I mean, we could do a whole presentation on that, so, so I'll, I will leave it here, but I'm very interested to talk to others later if, if, if you would like to speak about that more. Um, next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to dwell for one moment on the importance of the introduction at this stage of these standards for existing buildings. This is a diagram that we have um, drawn actually of the directive as it stands, so before the proposals that we're currently engaging with. And I think really what this uh, diagram sort of shows in a very simplistic way is the directive has a lot of clearly a lot of very very useful enabling tools within it and a lot of those have been spoken about actually already and they are illustrated some of them are illustrated in the in the top row of circles yellow circles here so there are um, you know frameworks set out for building assessment um, for calculating energy performance uh, framework set, it, set out to require strategy development at, at member state level really important sort of enablers what it's been shorter on was actual triggers to apply standards um, or to in fact improve buildings and so those triggers are identified in the second row of circles the first circle there is actually the standards for new buildings so really we only left with one trigger to cover the existing stock and actually improve the standards of the existing stock and that has been the trigger that's already been mentioned already been mentioned which is that when buildings undergo a major renovation then they should also have their energy performance improved so clearly there's a sort of big gap really identified at the sort of the right hand side of this diagram um, where those triggers and requirements for the performance standards of the existing stock um, to be uh, improved sits. And this is where I think METS is really important starts to fill this gap. So next slide, please. Um, and the Commission's proposal uh, doesn't come out of nowhere. <laughs> um, we do have some experience in, in individual member states of introducing minimum energy performance standards already into legislation. Some of those have actually already been implemented. Um, and you'll see uh, the examples here actually are not a full list. This is already out of date. These are some of the kind of perhaps more mature examples. Um, it is quite a, a, a swiftly moving landscape with member states kind of developing new, strat new strategies, new regulations, new standards all the time to try and meet higher standards. But you will see from this list here that actually the Commission's proposal does seem to build on um, the, the, the designs that have been adopted in a number of member states, thinking about France here, thinking about the countries of Great Britain, and to some extent thinking about the approaches taken in Flanders and Belgium, where they are very clearly focusing on those worst performing buildings and just shifting them up into the next performance brackets. Um, so next slide, please. Um, oh, actually, sorry, go back one. <laughs> so just, just to say, um, 
I do think is really incredibly important for all the reasons that I said around energy poverty, addressing the, the, the worst first, incredibly important to address these worst performing buildings. Um, but I would say that, that there is a bit of a missed opportunity um, in this design to trigger the renovation of these worst performing buildings, but then actually ask them to be renovated to much uh, higher standards than just the next EPC band, or the next worst performing um, class. Um, uh, because I think obviously taking the opportunity to, to trigger a renovation, there is a certain kind of certainly administrative burden around that. There is certain a building owner burden around that to understand the regulation, to sort of open up the door to the renovation. And once we've stepped our, our foot inside that doorway to the renovation, then let's get as much value as we can out of it. And so therefore, I think pushing a bit further and asking for higher standards to be met at those, those at the opportunity um, there is something we should certainly look to. And I would say that we are seeing at least at least one or two countries noticing that most clear example perhaps is, is in uh, England and Wales, the standard that address the worst performing non-domestic rented buildings of EPCE has now already been updated to be a much higher standard of EPCB by 2030. And the government's now committed to up upgrading that um, quite soon. So you can see that actually that future tra trajectory of, of renovation is super important. Um, and I'd just like to uh, finish by, if I may, I see Oliver appearing, which I think means my time is almost up. Very quickly, uh, next um, slide, please touching on two member states I think are doing something super interesting, which is to use their minimum performance standards in conjunction with the fossil fuel phase outs in heating. So in the Netherlands, for example, we're seeing um, it's actually an advisory standard, but it's been defined as, a, as an insulation standard that will be suitable to guide the buildings through the phase out of the gas system. Uh, next slide, please. Similar, um, so it sets an insulation level that will allow those buildings to be taken off high temperature gas and put on to a low temp lower flow temperature heating system. Scotland using a similar approach here um, in, its, in its strategy, which I, I really encourage you to read because it's very ambitious and very interesting. Um, and I think this is another way that member states could be looking to be more ambitious than perhaps that the energy performance uh, of buildings directive gives us. Um, the, if I can leave the final slide just for people to read is that I think we all recognize this, but um, regulations alone don't make successful renovations. So we, of course, when introducing all of these standards need to consider all of the other enabling factors. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Luis, for going so quickly through this presentation. And as always, we could spend you know, a, a full day on that topic of minimum energy performance standards alone, but it's excellent to see uh, your summary of how some of the European member states have already introduced that instrument and how this, these early movers have now encouraged the European Commission to propose this as a common European law which will then be implemented in all European member states. And um, I mean, the, the purpose of this uh, webinar, of this exchange also, is to connect people on both sides of the Atlantic. And as we're sharing the contact details of everybody, um, interested people in the audience can, of course, get back to you and the other speakers for more detailed interactions and, and look at the webinar also again in the recording. So thanks a lot, Luis, for your presentation. I would now like to invite our final speaker for today, uh, Michael Friedberg, to give us um, his perspective um, and the perspective actually of the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. Michael, you're a senior advisor for high performance buildings in HUD and with the Office of Environment and Energy. And I know you've prepared uh, quite a lot of slides, um, but I think we have maybe covered some of the topics already. So I would like yes. to invite you to be quite brief because we're officially more or less at the end of the webinar. It's also my fault yes. because I allowed for a lot of discussion. Um, but nevertheless, we have a little bit of a time squeeze, but I'm sure we can, you know, run about for 10 minutes or so over the official timing. Uh, Michael, so don't, please don't feel stressed, uh, but nevertheless, keep that in mind. Thanks in any case for joining us today. And I look very much forward to your presentation on setting the codes and standards to make sure that we have affordable housing because that's also a very, very important topic. Michael, thanks for joining us, yes. the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will be brief. Uh, it's been a fascinating discussion.
I think it would be good to do a follow on on these building performance standards, you know, in the particularly in the existing stock. Uh, and I certainly have a question for Louise, which we can either answer at the end or by email, you know, the the E and F and B ratings. Uh, what 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 are those uh, in terms of energy use or consumption? Uh, because we're we're not we're obviously not familiar with those specific ratings. Um, but that said, let me just say I'm with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and as I've been sitting here, I think I've been thinking, you know, the topic my 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 talk could probably be uh, applied codes and standards because. Um, you know, we're in the business of supporting local communities, um, do a wide range of community development projects, as well as um, support the financing and operation of affordable, but also market rate housing. We support about 5 million uh, affordable housing. I think the Europeans call it social housing. Uh, this is an example of a public housing project, which uh, went completely solar. They covered every one of their roofs with um, solar. So it's an example of what can be done. And I think we're seeing quite a bit of this happening in existing housing. Next slide. Um, and just, just to make the point, I think uh, there was a question about air quality, indoor air quality earlier on. You know, we look at this uh, uh, energy codes in a kind of holistic frame, which is um, promoting energy efficiency along with climate resilience, uh, health and safety uh, for our residents. And we have, you know, significant programs in each of those areas. We happen to be the agency that um, uh, is responsible after the immediate uh, response after a particular disaster or a natural uh, severe weather event. Uh, we do um, a lot of um, uh, disaster recovery work uh, with significant funding from Congress. So we are on the ground post facto once a climate event has happened and we want to be sure that when we rebuild we're, we're doing it uh, uh, build back better uh, to coin a phrase. Um, so indoor health, jobs and employment, job training and disaster preparedness are all part of the mix. Next slide. Um, I did want to just point to, I think we've talked extensively about the new construction standards, the 2021, I, the latest ones, the IECC and ASHRAE 90.1. Um, we <coughs> We are uh, very focused on uh, working to incorporate the latest standards in the inventory of housing that we uh, support either through our mortgage finance programs or through other programs. Uh, next slide. Um, this is not entirely readable, but the way we look at it uh, for each of our programs, in this case, we do a lot of multifamily mortgage uh, financing for multifamily preservation of existing housing as well as new construction. Um, and we have a minimum IECC and ASHRAE standard requirements uh, in the middle column. And then on the right, we have additional incentives for our uh, developers and borrowers and homeowners to go beyond those minimum standards. Next slide. And I think you've seen this slide before, at least on a couple of other occasions. The general point here is that this is uh, very much a, a diverse set of adoptees. These are codes are adopted at the state and local level. Um, we are in a unique position because we have a statutory requirement to uh, adopt the latest IECC codes and ASHRAE codes uh, if we can show that they're affordable and they will not negatively affect the availability of those standards. 
of the of the housing that's covered by those standards. Um, the numbers are, you know, very favorable, as has been pointed out. The average add-on cost for building to the latest IECC standard, this is DOE figures, uh, is about $5,500, which is about 3% of the average cost of a new home that we finance for, um, you know, low to moderate income borrowers, which adds about $20 per month to the debt service on a 30-year mortgage with cost savings three times that amount. So uh, very quick paybacks and very quick um, <clears throat> net annual positive cash flow on the latest IECC codes relative to the, the, the vast number of majority of those states that are TAN on this slide, which are at the 2009 IECC or equivalent. Next slide. Similarly, very good numbers. In fact, uh, almost immediate paybacks on uh, for commercial buildings, multifamily uh, construction, which is covered under four or, four or more stories uh, that is covered under the commercial building code. Next slide. Um, and uh, the latest uh, cost savings and energy savings from DOE for the latest IECC and ASHRAE codes are very, very, uh, uh, very good. Next slide. I think we've seen this, this slide before. We see these codes as a way to get us eventually to net zero. The 2021 IECC is essentially equivalent on an envelope level uh, to a net zero energy standard. So um, that's an important step in the right direction. Next slide. I, I wanna just to uh, quickly talk about how we bring some of this higher energy efficiency <clears throat> code work to uh, the market. And it really is through our financing programs. And I think if you look at the US, I think this is where we have made significant progress, at least on the multifamily side, where both our agency as well as the uh, so-called GSEs, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, have built in very strong incentives for um, developers to adopt above code standards. So we combine uh, a requirement for a green uh, building standard with uh, a commitment to an Energy Star score of 75 or above in Portfolio Manager. So we bring together a building performance standard and a green building standard, and then provide a very significant incentive on the financing front. Next slide. And I think if there's one additional point I want to bring to the table that hasn't really been addressed so far is the availability of this broad range of what might be called third party green building standards, um, including Passive House that was mentioned, um, which is the most efficient of all of these standards, but each of these uh, uh, green building standards are typically above code, uh, above the uh, IECC and ASHRAE code standards. It takes them a little while to get there, but we uh, provide a significant incentive through a reduced mortgage insurance premium for folks who will build to one of these standards. And we have seen a significant shift uh, about a significant share, the vast majority of our market rate borrowers are adopting these standards because of the availability of the incentive built into the financing. Next. Um, there's a lot more to say about 
the green mortgage insurance premium, and perhaps we can provide some uh, information. But on the other extreme, I wanted to bring in how we uh, address uh, bringing energy efficiency and green building to post-disaster uh, construction. And there's two parts of that puzzle. One is if a building needs to be rebuilt, uh, uh, and, uh, if if uh, building is um, demolished as a result of a hurricane or some other weather event and new building is required, then we do have in place a set of requirements to meet one of those green building standards that I just mentioned. Or if it requires 50% or more reconstruction, those green building standards do apply. Uh, and we work closely with the states and localities who receive our disaster recovery money to implement those standards. On the other hand, there's a broad swath of properties that don't reach that 50% reconstruction level. Uh, and for those properties, we put in place, uh, I guess, a more what I would call a building component approach, which is this retrofit checklist, which essentially uh, specifies particular you know, uh, products and appliances to be incorporated uh, as these homes are rebuilt. Uh, and without going into um, uh, the specifics, they heavily rely on Energy Star appliances and or water sense uh, products if you are replacing those pro products and then puts in place um, um, additional standards that um, are required if you are replacing those components. Next slide. Uh, so we go through lighting and windows, and, and uh, this is a, a relatively moderate intervention, uh, but it does require proper sizing of heating and cooling equipment according to you know, uh, uh, Manual J uh, and, and, and so on. Also LED lighting uh, where possible uh, and other energy star lighting. Next slide. Uh, and then we also build in a package of um, other green building measures that focus on health and safety and indoor air quality. Next slide. Uh, focus on mold remediation because these are often places that have flood events of some sort, lead safe work practices, radon testing, etc. Next slide. And I think this is the last slide. Uh, the good news is that we're seeing uh, a lot of good work that is happening in existing housing, particularly in uh, the low and moderate income housing sector. In some cases, these properties are leading the way uh, uh, beyond the private sector. But I do have to say that um, there's a lot more work that we have to do and there are some advanced building construction techniques that the Department of Energy has been supporting, um, including uh, learning from the European, the Dutch energy strong experience, um, looking at building wraps, wrapping buildings on the exterior, which is going to, which is going to be needed uh, if we're going to retrofit these buildings without displacing residents. Uh, and also, um, we're also very excited about the Department of Energy's net zero uh, energy standard or zero energy ready standard for multifamily housing. So there are some advanced uh, retrofit strategies that are being looked at. And we are uh, appreciative of the relationship we have with, with the Department of Energy to uh, explore how we can move those into more widespread use. So those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, and great that uh, we can also see some examples where these strategies are really implemented. And it's, it's also 
uh, quite encouraging to see that um, when you know buildings are rebuilt after a disaster that you have all these requirements because it might not be the first thought when you want to rebuild after a disaster to take care of efficiency requirements, indoor air quality, because often you know the the focus will probably be on making sure that people have homes again. But it's it's really encouraging to to see that is the case also in in, in these yeah sad circumstances. Um, I'm afraid we won't really have time for questions because we're actually over time already. Um, yes. But as I said earlier. I want to encourage all the participants, um, all the audience, um, the experts to connect with each other. As I said earlier, that's what these webinars are all about, to make sure that the connections are being established. And uh, we're going to share the recording of the webinar. And we are, of course, going to share the presentations in an email which is going out to all of you. And this is actually the last in our series of webinars. It was the fifth webinar and um, it's concluding this series. I think one red thread through all the webinars was the fact that there is so much interest for an in-depth exchange, uh, a deep dive into the many topics because what we're discussing here is a quite, yeah, it is a, a challenging, it is a complex topic. And therefore, um, I just want to encourage you to all stay in touch, be in touch. It is not yet quite the final output. Uh, we still have something in the pipeline. We still have some outputs which we're going to finalize in the coming two months. And you will hear uh, from us again before the end of February. But in terms of the webinar series, this is the final one. And therefore, I would like to thank again in particular all the colleagues who worked together and made that happen, colleagues who worked together in an excellent way, even though we never had a chance to meet uh, physically due to the corona restrictions. And um, these colleagues include the people in the Department of Energy, in the Department of Housing and Urban Development, in the delegation of the European Union in uh, Washington DC, in DG Energy in Brussels, the colleagues at the Institute for Market Transformation. And I would also like to thank uh, my team here at BPAE in the background who were very, very active and successful in organizing this uh, webinar series. So thank you everybody for listening in, for joining us. Uh, please stay in touch, please send us your feedback, send us your questions, but we will be in touch with you in any case so look out for an email or two from our side because we want to evaluate uh, the series which we did and we definitely want to stay in touch and encourage the collaboration across the Atlantic to make sure that the climate footprint, the climate impact of our buildings is decreasing over time so that we can deliver the spirit of the Paris Agreement. And with that, I would like to close. I wish you all a very happy and healthy 2022 a wonderful year ahead and i'm looking forward to hopefully hearing and meeting you in person one day all the best greetings from brussels bye bye